The most concise description of the original American system was provided in 1832 by a 23-year-old candidate for the Illinois State Legislature who belonged at the time to Henry Clay's Whig Party and was a lifelong admirer of Clay. Fellow citizens, I presume you all know who I am. I am humble Abraham Lincoln. I have been solicited by many friends to become a candidate for the legislature. My politics are short and sweet, like the old woman's dance. I am in favor of a national bank. I am in favor of the internal improvement system and a high protective tariff. These are my sentiments and political principles. If elected, I shall be thankful. If not, it will all be the same. Between the Civil War and the New Deal, Lincoln's Republican Party and the Hamilton, was the Hamiltonian heir to the pre-war Whig Party and also to anti-slavery Jacksonian Democrats. Uh, the Republicans, and, and they had Democratic allies, presided over what might be called the first American system. Most of the goals of the Hamilton, Clay, Lincoln American system were achieved. National banking laws, rather than a single national bank, a role played later by the Federal Reserve System. Internal improvements in the form of railroads paid for in many cases by federal land grants to railroad companies and high protective tariffs that sheltered American infant industries from British and European import competition. Rather than breaking with the Hamiltonian developmental economics of the Republicans uh, of that era, the New Deal of the 1930s and 1940s built upon it. Even as New Deal Democrats, who were dominant in that period, paid lip service to the Democratic Party's heroes, Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. Under Franklin Roosevelt and his successors, including the Republicans Eisenhower and Nixon, who ratified much of the New Deal and modified it, the federal government created what might be called a second American system. This one based on the technologies of the second industrial revolution, like the internal combustion engine and electricity. Uh, they used methods including federal subsidies for highway construction and rural electrification. Uh, they were also not afraid to use what might be called state capitalism. As Assistant Secretary of the Navy under President Woodrow Wilson uh, at the end of World War I, young Franklin Roosevelt at Wilson's direction allocated Navy funds to subsidize the creation of a national wireless monopoly, the Radio Corporation of America. You may have heard of it, RCA, uh, which later spun off the three major networks, which you may have heard from as well, ABC, NBC, and CBS. RCA in the 1920s and 1930s played a major role in the development of television and other innovative technologies. During the New Deal era from the 1930s to the 1980s, the federal government used air mail to subsidize the development of a domestic US airline industry and later created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, to develop rockets and satellites and send astronauts to the moon. Federal state capitalism in the service of American national industrial policy mainly took the form of defense department spending during the Cold War, which subsidized much of the development of satellite technology, the computer industry, and the global positioning system, GPS. The internet began as DARPAnet, a Pentagon-funded research uh, project linking researchers who had Defense Department contracts. In the last uh, part of the 20th century came the Third Industrial Revolution based on information technology, technology which, as we have seen, uh, was developed largely by contractors to the U.S. military in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and indeed, a third American system has been constructed based on the technologies of the Third Industrial Revolution and the way that the New Deal's second American system was based on the electromechanical era and the way that uh, Lincoln's first American system was based on steam power. Uh, this Third American system has been constructed between the 1970s and the 2000s with the bipartisan support 
of Reagan Republicans and Clinton Democrats. Uh, in many ways, uh, it has been a success, particularly in the uh, realm of infrastructure, since we have uh, fairly good wireless uh, uh, Wi-Fi capacity now, and uh, uh, a number of new businesses uh, whose business models would have been inconceivable without the internet. So to that extent, uh, it's been a success. Unfortunately, today's third American system, as I call it, is based on neoliberal globalism rather than economic nationalism, which was the basis of the previous two American systems, if we want to use that metaphor. So-called free trade treaties like NAFTA and the WTO were not really about free trade in the sense of increasing the number of products that were made in America that were sold to foreign consumers. The actual goal of these treaties, for the most part, has been to make it easier for US corporations to transfer manufacturing and some services from well-paid American workers to poorly paid, and in some cases, unfree uh, foreign workers. In 2007, President Alan Garcia of Peru, during a speech to the US Chamber of Commerce, made an offer to American businesses of a kind made by many other leaders of low-wage nations. Garcia said, come and open your factories in my country so we can sell your own products back to the US. Uh, some American corporate capitalists and uh, executives made it clear that the American national interest was of no particular interest to them. Walter Riston, the chair and CEO of Citicor and author of a neoliberal manifesto entitled The Twilight of Sovereignty in 1992, was quite candid. Quote, when steel mills can move to more hospitable climates, they no longer present a stationary target for government or union control, unquote. Uh, just as honest was Jack Welch, the CEO of General Electric, who declared in 1998, quote, ideally, you'd have every plant you own on a barge. These American capitalists had plenty of cheerleaders among pundits and policymakers from the 1980s to the present. Uh, Robert Bartley, the longtime editor of the Wall Street Journal, repeatedly proposed a constitutional amendment limited to five words. There shall be open borders. The New York Times uh, columnist Thomas Friedman declared, I wrote a column supporting the CAFTA, the Caribbean Free Trade Initiative. I didn't even know what was in it. I just knew two words, free trade. In the first and second American systems, the purpose of infrastructure was to create a single continental US market to the benefit of producers. In US manufacturing industries with increasing returns to scale, whose profits could then be shared with American workers in their communities. In today's third American system of neoliberal globalism, the United States is viewed as a giant consumer market for manufactured goods made elsewhere, mostly in industrial Asia. To add insult to industry, the Asian manufactured goods are carried to the US in container ships, most of them made in three Asian countries, China, Japan, and South Korea. By removing US federal subsidies designed to neutralize foreign subsidies, the free market ideologues in the Reagan administration completely destroyed the American civilian shipbuilding industry in the 1980s. It just collapsed within a decade. Today, China enjoys 45.2% of the global shipbuilding market, which is a, a great high-tech manufacturing market like aerospace and automobiles. Uh, the US share of global shipbuilding, any guesses? One half of 1%. The greatest beneficiaries of America's neoliberal globalist third American system, it can be argued, has been the hereditary communist princeling ruling class in China and the business executives at home and abroad whom they favor. During the 1970s and 1980s, uh, as my, some of my colleagues can attest, I was an ardent coal warrior. And I wouldn't have believed it if anyone had told me that after the Cold War, America's capitalists would go into business with China's communists at the expense of workers in both countries. Today, a single Chinese company, DJI, produces more than half of all civilian drones that are purchased worldwide. 
as well as the majority of drones used in U.S. domestic law enforcement. Meanwhile, in the last three decades, the U.S. has lost 70% of its semiconducting manufacturing industry to other countries, and in particular Taiwan. In 2020, China made 76% of the world's lithium iron batteries necessary for electric cars and all sorts of devices. The U.S. made 8%. In the 1990s, the U.S. led the world in mining for rare earths, essential for batteries and many products. In 2019, however, China produced 62% of raw rare earths, while the U.S. produced only 12.2%. 36.7% of the world's reserves of critical rare earths are held today by China. The U.S. share of global rare earths reserves is drum roll please, 1.1% compared to China's 36.7%. Uh, and we, we saw in the COVID-19 crisis, the extent of the dependence on Chinese manufacturers of the US for, for basic medicines, and uh, that includes antibiotics, 97% of the US market from China, ibuprofen, 90%, hydrocortisone, 91%, acetaminophen, 70, so one can go on and on and on. The point is that Alexander Hamilton, Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, and Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon, among many others, would be appalled at America's self-inflicted deindustrialization. It took two centuries for the U.S. to build up the most advanced and dynamic manufacturing base in the world in a few decades for U.S. corporations to dismantle much of it in their scramble for higher short-term profits and cheap labor. This brings us back to the question uh, that I like to, to ask uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s when uh, Senator Al Gore was running uh, for office. Uh, he let it be known that with every issue he asked, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Uh, so in this case, I think it would be helpful to ask WWHD, what would Hamilton do? Or rather, what would the entire cumulative wisdom of the Hamiltonian tradition have us do today? The way forward is clear. We need to replace the neoliberal globalist third American system with a fourth American system. The fourth American system will not resemble Lincoln's first American system or the Roosevelt Eisenhower second American system in detail. But a few generalizations are possible and I look forward to what my colleagues on the panel in addition to uh, Johnny have to say about it. Uh, one is that the invent it here, make it there model of neoliberal globalization must be scrapped, at least in the case of strategic industries. R&D and skills education are enough, but not enough, not sufficient. The U.S. cannot be a major military power if it loses essential manufacturing. We need to invent it here and make a lot more of it here at the same time. This means there must be some limits on the ability of corporations to offshore production from the U.S. to other countries. In strategic sectors, local content rules should be imposed and enforced by tariffs or encouraged by subsidies. Uh, in the most defense critical industries, the government should consider simply nationalizing U.S. factories or mines uh, and removing uh, them from commerce altogether. If these measures raise the price of certain consumer goods or business inputs in the U.S., then so be it. National security and national independence cost money, and all benefits come with trade-offs. The goal of U.S. industrial policy should not be autarky. It's not to have a self-enclosed North Korean type economy. It is merely to replace or rearrange a limited number of important but privately created corporate global supply chains to better promote the interests of the US and its allies while leaving other supply chains uh, untouched. Uh, neither national security nor national prosperity require us to make all uh, goods in completely in the United States from raw materials to the finished uh, product. In the fourth American system, uh, the federal government will need to work with private industry and capital and state and local governments 
as well as foreign governments to create the infrastructure needed by new technologies and business systems. Last but not least, the next American system should compel American companies, large and small, to share their profits with their workers in the form of living wages and adequate social benefits. Thank you for your attention.